Hi guys, and uh, and welcome to another border crossing. Uh, it seems like that's what I'm, all I'm doing uh, these days is uh, border crossings. But as I've mentioned in the previous uh, uh, video, um, I got news that uh, I, I initially booked a, a boat, uh, a ship to sail from Panama to Cartagena in the first week of December. Um, but that ship. Uh, uh, that uh, vessel was cancelled about a week before this video took place on November the 12th, 2016. And so therefore I had to scramble to find an alternative. Uh, the initial one was like a small a small sailing boat crew, uh, a total of about eight people on board. Um, I thought it might be a bit more of an internet experience, but they cancelled it. And then I basically went to what should have been my first option anyway, which is the Star Rat. It's a German boat, 114 years old, I think, uh, about 100 foot long, old sailing ship. Um, beautiful boat, old, um, so no real big creature comforts, but really well pointed up, up, up top and on the deck, uh, big tables and lots of cover, hammocks and that to sleep on outside if you want. If you want to sleep down below, you can. It's pretty hot down there though. Uh, at, the, at the time of year we, we left. So basically, um, around about the 6th or 7th of November, I found out that I had to, I, I was put on reserve for the Star Rat, and then about three days later, I paid a deposit, and then about three days later, I was given the okay, and somebody else had cancelled. So, bang, I was uh, I was on the boat on the 23rd. However, my issue was, is I had to cross through about five or six countries of four or five countries to, to make sure that I got there two or three days earlier. So my target date was the 20th of November to get to uh, to Panama City, um, which meant really, unfortunately, skipping through um, Honduras, uh, only one night in Honduras, two days, and uh, two days in Nicaragua, um, two days in uh, Costa Rica, three days in Costa Rica, I think I took. So yeah skipping through so this is my ride from El Cuco to Tisucigalpa uh, in Honduras which is a pretty it's the capital city of Honduras and a pretty and a pretty big city at that um, and a real bustling type city but where I stayed was the a Grand Hyatt in uh, for one night, uh, um, the, the the spiffy hotels, you know. It, it, the, look, the issue was is I basically had to find something, find something quick, and I and I did that. You know, I the, the hotel was some of these hotels are really dark, so you get to the lobby, which was downstairs, and then you unload. I had to unload my bike, and then I had to take all my gear upstairs to the lobby, and then get into another lift. And it wasn't that easy, you know. The rooms were nice, if a bit, I can't remember how I described it, but a bit sterile, like a bit boring. Internet was so-so, again. Um, but it was in a nice area, nice nice shops, and just outside of there was the market area. Um, you know, you didn't have to walk very far, but this, the area that I was uh, staying in was really like a lot of security guys with shotguns and stuff like that which you'll get used to it's a bit of a shock when you first get there seeing machine guns on the back of on the back of uh, four-wheel drives and lots of army and military and stuff like that um, and Honduras does have a storied past uh, but apparently I was speaking to a guy named Todd at, at Palmetto Motorsports today and he rides there a fair bit said it's fantastic riding. I, I enjoyed the ride today. These roads, I've said in the previous video, absolutely love them. Absolutely love them. Um, well, tree-lined roads. Well, I mean, on, all these Central American countries are really, really green. Um, so they're obviously near the, the equator, very tropical. Um, that's me being an idiot. Uh, unfortunately, there's, you'll probably see another shop coming up soon. But amazing views, but anywhere where you can stop, there was just garbage everywhere, like littered. It seems that th these countries just do not have any sort of um, systems in place for 
recycling or anything like that. And, uh, you know, really companies like Coca-Cola, because it's, Coca-Cola is everywhere. Um, you, you stop by a, a, a roadside cafe, or well, not cafe, just a roadside stop, some beautiful little view there, terrible photo, but beautiful view. A roadside, and, and they'll have an esky with ice in it, and all they'll have in it is Coca-Cola. Uh, so you don't have much of a choice if you want a cold drink. Um, but they really should do something about a Coca-Cola and maybe Pepsi getting together and working with the government to create, you know, to create job opportunities for, for these people to pick up garbage and create recycling plants where they can, you know, manufacturers can use the recycled elements for, for their, you know, for whatever they want to produce and, and, and get really smart about it because it, it seems that, you know, we call it the plastification of everything. Everything comes in plastic now and basically there's just shit everywhere. You get to a really beautiful spot and you think, oh, this would be nice up here and then you drive closer and it's just garbage thrown everywhere. So it's pretty sad, but that's the way it is. So this border crossing was, um, you know, Central America probably have the most convoluted border crossings for motorbikes you can think of. Um, it's crazy, like, yeah. Everything's like this border crossing. El Salvador, getting out of El Salvador took me about 30 minutes. But you know, again, there's a booth before you. You know, I'm riding pretty slow here because I'm trying to work out which way to go. But you have booths to do one thing and then another booth half a mile up the road to do the other. It's so easy to miss it. So make sure you do some reading um, online about what to do with your, with your border crossings. Um, and, and just make sure, I can't remember if I made a mistake here and went the wrong way, but anyway. Um, just make sure you read up as much as you possibly can about the border crossing um, and you're prepared. You know, again, as I said in the previous border crossing videos, make sure you've got multiple copies of all your documents, your, your passport, your, your title, your, your registration, your driver's license. So your passport page, which is your photo page of your passport, um, and and if you and if you've got already got an import permit in one country, just get two or three copies of that. Usually at a hotel or anywhere nearby, you'll be able to get um, you'll be able to find a photo copier and, and print them out. I, I basically took a photo of every single document that I every import document, like uh, Google Photos have a photo scan thing, and it's really good. Um, so you can you can basically run it like a scanner of your phone over over the document and then save it on, online. You know, it, you, you might, might not pass if you lose your document, but if you but at least you've got something if you do in there. And if they put it into a computer system, uh, you'll be fine. So this border crossing, El Salvador, I think it took me around about 30 minutes to get through. So basically, you know, you you get your, your stamp out. Um, I actually got stamped out of Honduras. Some people that I that I spoke to said they didn't get a stamp out, uh, but I mean, it, you know, either or, most of them don't really look for the previous stamp, some of them do. Um, but anyway, stamped out, Yeah, this is where I'm trying to work out where to go. Um, yeah, I think I did make a wrong turn and had to go back. So, so yeah, you'll get, usually you go to immigration first, get stamped in or out. And then you've got to work out. Then you've got to do the uh, the import permit. So you've got to, you've got to get your import permit cancelled. Uh, and like in El Salvador, I needed to get four copies on the El Salvador side of, uh, and you can't get them beforehand. So this is coming up to the border here. Um, you actually there's there's just a booth right next. So you see the rubbish all there, just bags of stuff that people have thrown out. So getting to the border is um, so what you do is you uh, once you've got your the import permit cancelled you've then got to go across the road or oh, it's next, next door actually so the lady sitting in a little open office crappy thing and pay you know I think it cost me about a, I just gave her a dollar basically US dollar for about I think I've got four copies of the uh, permit and then you've got to take two of those copies uh, and hand them in once you get to the uh, to the next booth, and so, so, so once you get to the guard, sorry, on the Honduras, on the El Salvador side, and then you need another couple of copies 
Um, it's just ridiculous the amount of paperwork that you have to go through. Uh, if you run into trouble, as I've said previously, you'll get a flock of people coming up to you wanting to help you. Choose one person that understands English, tell them that you, you show them that you know exactly how much it costs, so and that you'll pay them a set fee. Five dollars, ten US dollars. Ten US dollars is pretty generous for all Central American countries. Um, I used to give about ten dollars if the guy was good, um, and then I'd give five dollars. I, I, I mean, a couple of times I walked away, the guy, I told them at the start that if they try to try any smart stuff and they try to get more money out of me than what, what I know is the cost, then uh, they're out and they've got to understand that. So, and yeah, you know, I said, as soon as you try anything with me, you, you're not getting any money, okay? And, and the, the main thing that you've got to do is you've got to always hold on to your, if they say, oh, give me your passport, and you say, no, 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 no I'll, I'll walk with you with my passport because that's their, that's their bar, bar, bartering tool. If they, if they can get hold of your passport and your import permit um, or any of your other personal documents, especially the originals, they can then hold you to ransom. And that, that happened to a few guys that I met along the way to the tune of hundreds of US dollars. And um, yeah, so not good. Um, so you've got to really be really careful about that. Most of them are going to be fine, but you're going to, the, the ones that really start chasing after you and and wanting to get your business, they're the ones to be worried about, you know. Um, some of them will just walk up to you and say hello and just tell them that they, they can help you if you want. So this guy here, he's like really, really keen for me. He met me down the road a bit and started driving driving up and uh, he was really keen. I hadn't agreed to anything yet and then I ended up having a chat to him and told him what's gonna be happening, you know. Um, and he was like really keen, in the end we, we agreed um, on, on, a, on a fee and uh, he wasn't happy at all. Um, but I just said, look, he reckons he can get me to the front of the lines. And I just said, okay, if you can get me to the front of the lines, so this guy here in the blue was the wanker. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's then crossing, when you cross this bridge, um, so I've got, right now I've got through uh, the Honduras the El Salvador side, but I was crossing over to the Honduras side. Then you drive up, and there, there's the. This is where you get get all that stuff done. This was a bit more of a pain in the ass. This took about two hours basically uh, on on the on the Honduras side to get into the country. Just like so many bits of paper, and I didn't know. I, I was lost at the end. They gave me all this paper and said go now, but then I had to. Once I got a bit further up the road, I actually had to hand them in at a booth to this guy and he took them all and then I was on my way. You just, I just checked to make sure I had a copy of the import permit. There's, I always check, I've got uh, on my phone under Google Keep, I've got my VIN number, my registration number. So I can just do a quick, I mean, I, I can remember my registration, but not my VIN. And I just do a quick check to make sure that's 100% right. Because anything wrong with it, they can cause you big headaches at the other end. So, and a lot of the time they scribble it down and you and you basically, Sometimes you have to ask them to make sure they write it clear. And they'll say, oh, no, 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 it'll all be fine. But the guy at the other end doesn't care about the guy at that end. So you've just got to be really vigilant about that. Um, but yeah, so all up, I think about two and a half hours I spent at that border, which is pretty much what the standard fare through Central America. And in South America, in certain border crossings, a lot quicker. Um, I mean, I, I, I think my record was about 15 minutes was like this, that was in and out, uh, out and in of a country. That's pretty amazing. So they're really happy days when that happens. Um, my, my worst one was the uh, Colombia Ecuador border. The Ecuador side was just a complete not a joke. Um, and and in else uh, in uh, as I exit Honduras, I had an accident. Uh, the next video I'll talk about that and show you some stuff from that. Um, but uh, the next border was pretty tough but the worst one was um, the worst one for me was uh, Colombia Ecuador just three hours standing in one line ridiculous and you get to the front there's like 15 15 open spots where people could be working and there's like two people working in the whole office 
and you know, hundreds and hundreds of people in a line just to complete that a joke. So, I mean, I, I, I remember I stopped and I saw a guy who was from, um, he was from uh, Turkey and he was riding it and I, he must have been about an hour in front of me and then when I got to the border of Colombia, Colombia Ecuador border, he was standing in that line, I said, please tell me you just got here. He said, no mate, I've been here for about an hour. And so that was devastatingly painful getting into Ecuador. And you think like a really, one of the more modern countries in South America, just so pathetic. Um, just nobody gave a shit. The guy on the front door who was letting people in was taking bribes, left, right and centre, you know, pretty, pretty pathetic. But you sort of, um, as I've spoken about before, you just get your head right. I always say three hours, this is what it's going to take me three hours. So um, I had plenty of time and, you know, whenever I do a boarding crossing, I don't make it a big riding day. I try not to. I'm trying to make it like a four or five hour of, of riding. So I pick the town that's four or five hours in there and then with two or three hours, it's a seven or eight hour day. So it's just about being smart. Uh, Honduras was really beautiful. The, the roads were, were decent for most of the way. Um, they got a bit rough in places. And there's, again, a lot of patches you can see there on the road. There's someone who's got a flat tire on the right hand side there. Um, yeah, um, stopping with, I, I, I'd stop and help out any uh, adventure rider, but other, other than that, there's a lot of people broken down on motorbikes on the side of the road. And unless I'm in the middle of nowhere, uh, um, I won't help them if I'm, if I'm, because there's like, you know, there's mopeds, there's those Baja bikes, the Indian bikes, all that sort of stuff, and you know, if you just be stopping all the time, and you, know, you just you just let those guys. But any any adventure, even if I saw an adventure on the side of the road, I'd always stop and say hello anyway. Um, but yeah, Honduras, uh, very green, lots of uh, like mountain landscapes, and um, you know, starting to get into some of the big rank, mountain ranges, which is pretty cool. And I love bridges, you know. Uh, I love all these type of bridges and I try to get up off my on, on my pegs when I go over them so you can see a little bit more. They're really cool. Um, so yeah, Tessi Di Golpa. There's so many names I can't remember pronounce. Um, uh, Tessi Di Golpa, um, pretty big city. Uh, I got there probably around about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, and then basically got all my gear up, went through my normal routine, put the pair of socks go in the sink with some uh, camp suds. Um, I, I hook up my battery, uh, my power pack, my anchor powerhouse. Just have to look around there. Um, hook up my anchor powerhouse, hook up all my devices, get, every, get everything charged and have a shower, have a beer and then head out and look around the town for about three or four hours. That's what I did. There you can see the rubbish again a lot more. Uh, but that's pretty much everywhere, you know. So you... I'm just trying to think of this, this town. No, I didn't stop here. Um, you just see rubbish lined on the road. Anytime you get in, you can see it on the right hand side. Anytime you get into any town, it's like that. If you see the cones in the middle of the road, usually there's some security guys nearby. Sometimes they're working, sometimes they're not. Um, you just take you go a little bit slower as you go through those things. But all in all, it wasn't too bad. I mean, it wasn't too bad a, a crossing. It was just it just got confusing with the paperwork because they were asking for copies of all these different things and I've written about them on my blog, um, all the copies that they'll give you. Um, when I left Honduras, as I entered, sorry, Honduras, I was think, thinking, what, what is all this paperwork, you know? And I don't know what they do with it all. I've mentioned this before. It's just, they must just have piles of paper they just end up throwing out because, I mean, who's going to collect all this? I mean, it's it would be a truckload a week, a full tractor trailer, you know, big truck full of papers every single week from every single border crossing. I mean, you know, they, do, they input it into a computer as well, so. 
in some some places the internet's not working on the computer, so you've got to wait for the internet to start working again, and then you've got to wait around. But they're growing countries, so that's just the way it is. Um, so Honduras, uh, beautiful countryside. Apparently, most of the really cool stuff is up north, and so just about all the adventure riders that I met along the way basically said, oh, no, no, we're not going to... We, we, everyone, pretty much everyone skipped through Honduras and you know I was speaking with Todd from Palmetto Motorsports today and he was saying oh no it's a beautiful country for riding bikes so I mean I would have you know normally with each country even the small countries like this I was going to be you know three to five days in each country but I had to change my plans uh, I, had to, I had 15 days to cut off my original plan to get to Panama and, um, and get on the Star Wrap, which was a fantastic adventure. And I suggest that if you're going to be doing the crossing, you're not going to, it's $1,200 for you and the bike, uh, maybe $1,250 for, for you and the bike. All the food's included for uh, four nights normally. Um, so a couple of young guys decided to save some money. They catch, they put the, bo the bikes on the boat, which was $500 a bike, and then they go get a plane. But to get to the boat was like a three hour drive, two to three hours of riding to get to the, to where you, the San Blas area where you, where, you, where you get onto the, the ship out of Panama. So they had to get back from there. Then they had to book three nights accommodation. Plus they had to book all their food, which is all, all included on the trip. So you, four nights, sorry. So you think about that, three or four nights, um, four days of food, you know, 50, 60, let's just say $60 a day, $70 a day all up. Well, let's say 60, and then the, then the airfares, which were 300 each. So they're looking at 600. They've, they've maybe saved themselves $100 for all that hassle, you know. And, you know, I just that would have just been so painful for them. And I think they regretted it because if, if we met them in Cartagena about a week later, and they sort of thought they should have just gone and got the boat. But at the, at the time, you know, they're thinking budget, which is fine. I sort of get that. Actually, one of them had an accident on the way to. The, he came off the bike on the way to the to the Star Wrap to deliver his bike. Uh, I don't think he was that experienced a rider. He ended up quitting, you know. And you know, I've spoken about that uh, guy named Alex Shikon, who's a bit of an adventure rider. He was he was saying that out of every hundred riders that that have that go for the big journey from North America to all the way down to Patagonia, only a bit less than 10 make it. So I'm pretty, you know, I don't know if that's 100% true, but I'm pretty, you know, out of the group of the 18 or 19 that I was with, not all of them were going all the way down. So, um, but I know of about four or five that didn't make it uh, for different reasons. You know, that's not all, it's not all about, you know, the ability. Um, the ability to ride, if you, you you could start riding and learning to ride in, in North America, this is what I think, that you could start your riding uh, and in North America, and as long as you're not an idiot, that means you're not a tailgater, you don't sit behind the back of cars, you don't ride fast, you you think and you, and you, and you ride within your ability, um, it, pretty much anyone can make it. Uh, down there, you know, it's you don't need to be a highly skilled rider. Um, there's some really tough patches, and yeah, you're going to come off your bike. This it's a hundred percent guaranteed you're going to come off your bike at some stage. Um, but normally, when it, it, all the rough stuff that I went through, I was I was going so slow that you know it didn't really matter. The only I had a couple of accidents, and the two accidents on my trip that could have been a lot worse. Uh, one in, on the next border. Um, with a massive pothole uh, came off my bike and then the other one uh, just basically um, skill level wasn't up for it um, for me a little bit risky um, skill level wasn't up, up for it um, on it was a really hard surface but that it just rained so the top was as slippery as everything as anything it was on clay and my bike was already slipping but I, I got pretty confident I was getting getting really good at 
getting around the corners with, with a, not ridiculous speed, but just getting around the corners um, at, you know, probably about 30 miles an hour. Uh, and I just got one corner and I got stuck in a bit of a rut, uh, you know, one of the, the, the tracks and uh, the, the bike just started sliding out, the back wheel started sliding in and out of it, just jumping everywhere and then I just lost control and just slid down, more embarrassing than anything else. Um, but you learn, to, you learn to roll with those sort of things and it just meant after that I just took it a lot, a lot easier. I thought, come on, you know, because I was getting a little bit too confident uh, on the dirt, you know, and Dirt for the most part, if it's hard, it's it's pretty easy to just fly. You know, you can go. You can, oh, the the good dirt roads I was doing 80 kilometres an hour, 60 mile an hour, 55 mile an hour. Sorry, 50, 55 mile an hour maximum. Um, but any corners I was slowing right down because with the corners, you had um, a lot of the times on the corners it was dug up a lot, the trucks and big ruts and stuff like that. So you had to slow right down. Um, so now this is getting into the main city. Whenever there's lots of traffic, you know, you're getting into a bit of a major city. But, um, yeah, so, but then the, the other roads, uh, some of the other off-roads, I, I uh, take take my time a lot more. Um, and, you know, there was plenty of roads I went on that I was thinking that any moment I can come off. So my, my big, my 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 weaknesses are, are, are not mud. Mud's not too bad. Like wet dirt, wet, when the bike can grip somewhere as it goes down, it's not too bad. Um, but it's where it's really slippery, just the top part. And that that uh, Ecuador Peru border, it was really hard surface. But the top was this. It was this red clay, and the top was as slippery as. Uh, Any time I accelerated, the back of the bike just wanted to go out. Um, so it's just a matter of uh, keeping the bike up tall and um, and trying to keep, keep keep the bike upright as much as you can around the corners rather than sort of leaning down. A little trick, this guy just overtook me and went flying past. So you learn to do a bit of this where you're riding between two two lanes and most of the trucks and cars already know that this happens, one on the inside, one on the outside. It gets a little bit crazy, but this is at two times speed, so I was going a lot slower than this. But the trucks and all the buses and all those, most of the, the buses don't care, but the trucks usually hold their line pretty well. They don't try to do anything without looking at you know. I mean, they're ex experienced riders. They're not in any rush. They, they obviously are in a bit of a rush to get somewhere, but they, they know that any accident screws them right over. So, so yeah, this is getting. In, this is what you basically have to put up with in any of the cities. Um, you just want to make sure. This is where you find out whether your bike is overheating or not. <laughs> you know, I, one of the services I got done, they, they forgot to put the seal back on the coolant so when i got into medellin all of a sudden my the heat gauge on my bike was just going up 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 and just started boiling out of the coolant tank and uh on my ktm the design floor is just that the coolant tank you got to basically take my your, your roll bars off and then you got to take the panels off the bike to get it in which is just ridiculous uh, this is the capital city like any capital, road works are happening everywhere. Everything's really slow. It's really hot, <laughs> and you just gotta put up with it. What are you doing, buddy? Um, yeah. So um, only one night here, and then I was uh, on to Nicaragua, and uh, my first accident. I had a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing how you how after you've had an accident, how you feel. The first time I was really pumped up because it was, uh, I had the adrenaline going right through me because it was a real surprise, you know. Um, uh, the, the second one, I was more embarrassed than anything else. I just didn't want anyone else to see me with my bike laid over, so I got everything together. You know, the first thing you do when you have a bit of a, bit of a spill is get to your bike, turn the bike off, 
then make sure you get it into a safe position wherever it is on the road. And then you just got to probably take your gear off, especially if you're a venture rider, get all your gear off the bike and then just lift it up. Um, the first accident, my bike ended up rolling straight ahead. It, it, we, I got into a big ditch and jumped high. And I got thrown off the bike uh, um, straight up, landed on my back, my backside of my backpack, which I had all my rain gear in anyway. So I had a fair bit of padding there and I, my helmet just hit, my back of my head just hit the dirt at the back. Uh, so the helmet saved me, but that was the end of that helmet. I had to replace it immediately. Um, uh, the second one, nothing. I no, just got some dirt and my pride, my ego was dented pretty severely. Um, but no one saw me, thank God. It was, I was, it was in a border, a really remote border crossing. So it was a really cool border crossing, and uh, but it was really amazing riding. But anyway, guys, um, as usual, uh, questions and comments below. And uh, yeah, look forward to hearing from you guys. Thank you.